Hello, and welcome to the Current Science and Technology podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm Brenda Moneyappen, your host. Every week, we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. In this segment, we'll hear how thin sheets of carbon can be used to improve DNA sequencing. Sequencing the human genome, that is, identifying 6 billion DNA bases, is an astounding feat that researchers accomplished in 2000. The process of DNA sequencing has greatly improved in the decades since the Human Genome Project began, but it can still be laborious and expensive. The museum's Kareen Tate is here to discuss a prospective technique that could speed up the sequencing process. Hi, Kareen. Hi, Brenda. Is DNA sequencing a technique that's still important? I mean, we've already sequenced a giant genome, the human genome. So do we still need DNA sequencing? We do. DNA sequencing is really the key to personalized medicine. Even though we've sequenced the human genome, everyone's genome is slightly different. And understanding those differences can really help us personalize our medicine. But also there's big sections of the of the genome that we don't really understand what it does. So there's a tremendous tremendous amount of research still going on in the area of genomics and really understanding what all our genes do. Okay, so even though the human genome has been sequenced, not every single detail, or at least as applied to all of the billions of people on Earth, have been identified. That's right. Well, how is this new idea an improvement over conventional DNA sequencing methods? Well, when we first sequenced the human genome, it was a huge undertaking. It took us more than a decade. It cost us about $3 billion dollars. And luckily, we've really improved how we do that. So nowadays, we've been able to bring down the time to about a week and bring down the cost to several tens of thousands of dollars. So it's been really a huge improvement, but it's still quite, as you mentioned, a laborious and complex process. It involves, you know, extracting DNA, chopping it up into these little pieces, making a whole bunch of copies of it, tagging it with fluorescent markers, and then trying to read it from there. And in 2004, the National Institutes of Health put out a program to challenge researchers and figure out how can we make this process process simpler and cheaper. The idea is, can we sequence a human genome for about $1,000 or less? $1,000 is 10 times less than what it costs right now to sequence one person's genome. Is that really a reasonable amount of money to aim for? Well, actually it is. Think about how much we brought it down from when we initially did it. In about 10 years, we brought it from $3 billion just down to a few tens of thousands. Uh, so it does seem to be within our reach. There is a tremendous amount of research going on in this area trying to improve DNA sequencing techniques. And just this past summer, a number of labs at, at universities made really great breakthroughs in this area. And they just published this summer a lab from Harvard, from MIT, from the University of Pennsylvania, and the Kavli Institute of Nanoscience in the Netherlands all published their research into a really new and innovative methodology to sequence DNA much quicker and easier than we do right now. What's so special about this new method that all these various groups hit upon at the same time? Well, it all has to do with a new nanomaterial called graphene. Graphene just came onto the research scene within the last five or six years. So a lot of labs started working with it about the same time. And it's a really unique material. It's a single layer of carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb lattice pattern, or these kind of six-sided hexagon-shaped carbon rings that are all joined together. Basically, it's the thinnest sheet we could ever create. It's essentially two-dimensional because it's only one atom thick. Corrine, we just heard about a device that has a layer of carbon nanotubes in a thin film. Are carbon nanotubes similar at all to graphene? They are. A carbon nanotube structurally is essentially just a rolled up sheet of graphene. And these new carbon nanomaterials have kind of garnered so much excitement and praise recently because they have these incredible properties due to their atomic structure. They are very, very strong. They're excellent electrical and heat conductors. They're flexible 
and lightweight and even transparent. So they have all these new properties, and it's really kind of an exciting time in research with these new materials. Graphene's applications don't just include the solar thin films you mentioned, but any, everything from electronics to medical applications as well. And this promising material even garnered a whole bunch of news attention recently. Just last month, the two researchers in the UK, Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoselov, were just awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for their work isolating this new material and their initial experiments on it. Well, graphene sounds like it's got some pretty amazing properties for use in electronics and for optimizing electricity production, but how would it be used for DNA sequencing? The key to it is the fact that it's such a thin membrane. They take this thin sheet of graphene and suspend it in a salt solution. And on this this sheet of graphene, what they've done is essentially drilled these tiny little holes, or what they call nanopores. And each hole is really only one or two nanometers thick, essentially 100,000 times thinner than a human hair. So these holes are really tiny. And they suspend it in a salt solution, and they apply a voltage to this membrane. Now, what that does is create a current as ions in the salt solution are pulled through these tiny holes. We can detect this electrical current. Now, if there's DNA in the salt solution as well, long strands of DNA can also be pulled through these tiny nanopores, much the same way a needle and thread gets pulled through a fabric. Right, because DNA has an electric charge, it's negatively charged, and so when a current is applied, negatively charged DNA will move toward the positive end. You're absolutely right. So that charge pulls it through these nanopores on its own. Now what's really exciting, though, is that the electrical current changes when the DNA gets pulled through it. So we kind of detect this decrease in electrical current. And every one of the four nucleotide bases that make up DNA changes that current a little bit. So detecting these subtle differences in the current could tell us exactly which nucleotide base is passing through the membrane at any given time. And that essentially leads us to sequencing the DNA strand. I see. So as the DNA molecule moves through the pore, each of the four DNA bases produces a different change in the electric current that can be measured. And that's compared to conventional methods, which normally place a different fluorescent tag on each of the four bases, and those fluorescent tags are identified. That's right. So it's a much easier method of of reading it, just picking up these differences in the electrical current. So I've mentioned there's a lot of research in this area. And up until now, there was a tremendous research into pulling strands through other membranes. The problem was that these other membranes were just too thick. They were 30 to 40 nanometers thick, which meant, you know, 30 to 40 bases would be in there at any given time. So what makes this methodology so successful is that this thin membrane is so thin, it's less than a nanometer thick, Well, the spacing between the bases of DNA is also less than a nanometer. So that lets us read one base at a time. And that's really the key to determining what the sequence of the DNA is. Uh, So the thickness or thinness of the membrane corresponds to how many bases might move through the pore and therefore how many bases at a time would be detected. That's right. Is graphene sequencing being used right now? Even though this was a huge breakthrough in making this methodology a reality, we're not quite there yet. The problem we have right now is that we can't control the speed that DNA passes through this membrane. And right now it's passing much, much too quickly for us to actually detect the differences in the current. So even though in theory this methodology should work just fine, the last piece of the puzzle that we need to solve is slowing down the DNA and controlling the rate through which it passes the membrane. Well, Karine, that, that's a little bit humorous because the goal here was to improve or speed up DNA sequencing, but the current problem with graphene sequencing is that actually it's too fast and needs to be slowed down a little bit. That's right. But once we do that, we've kind of solved the problem. Would graphene sequencing be a big cost improvement over current sequencing methods? 
The idea is that it would be for a few different reasons. First, this just simplifies and streamlines the process so much. We should be able to sequence a genome in just a few hours this way rather than an entire week and we don't have all this the different steps in the lab that we need to go through. And also, even though it does use a, a high-tech material like graphene, graphene actually isn't that hard to come by because graphene is just carbon-based and it's it's found in graphite, which is is essentially in pencils and even in soot and ash from burning wood and coal. So graphite is just a whole bunch of graphene sheets stacked on top of one another, and we're getting better and better at isolating just single sheets of graphene. So even though it's quite a specialized material, it's actually not as rare as you might think. All right, so it's a common material, but really with very unique properties and with many applications. Thank you for telling us all about its potential application for improving DNA sequencing. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Brenda. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org forward slash CST or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening. 